rules, not just for democracy, which they killed in Europe, but that they would actually come to the United States. So, the only other film that actually even uses the word Jew, that I think, is Mortal Storm, where you see a Jewish professor who's coded as such, although it's never really said he's Jewish, but at one point there's a passport and there's a J in it, which is really seen by that. But otherwise, Hollywood, and of course we're talking about Jewish producers, really stayed away from the topic of the fact that one of the main reasons for the Germans fighting the war was the war of conquest, but also the war to uh, Annihilate. take the wealth of Jews and eliminate the Jews as population. Got you interested in this film, particularly? Oh, uh, um, I, I actually wrote my dissertation about, uh, and that was many, many years ago, about the German Jewish refugees from Berlin and Vienna in the film industry who ended up going to Hollywood. And my thesis was that many of them, including Alfred Neumann and Josef Tan, the, uh, the authors of the, the screenplay, and um, also uh, Andre de Tott, who had worked in Germany in the film industry, uh, was that they usually got their first jobs in Hollywood making anti-Nazi films because Hollywood producers, well, well, who else to ask but, you know, the victims. So one of the most uh, uh, kind of frequent anecdotes within the emigre community in Hollywood, and we have to, there were upwards of five to six hundred professionals from the industry that ended up working in Hollywood in one capacity or another, and many more that actually came and couldn't find work. But uh, one of the anecdotes was that, you know, when in 200 years people go into the, uh, the vaults and look and try to figure out what the Nazis look like, they will discover that the Nazis were a purely Semitic race. Yeah because they were played in Hollywood almost exclusively by German Jewish refugees. Like in Casablanca, right? Yeah. Casablanca, yeah, I mean, it's so filled, it. chocked full. I mean, most of these films, all, all of, most of the Nazis in, in this film uh, were, were in fact uh, German Jews. Really? So, yes. Wow. <laughs> Except, uh, the uh, obviously the the lead characters, but you know the secondary roles, the ones with German accents. Yeah. Wow, that's very interesting. I want to go back to the scene. I mean, it yeah, it is pretty horrific. Um, the speech that the uh, rabbi gives in the film is partially the words of the. Uh, leader of the Spanish revolutionaries, La Pasionara, so uh, uh, Lester Cole, who was, was a member of the Communist Party and was the American author who worked on this, on this, this script, he, he snuck that in. Um, the, the original, the film is actually based on a novel by Alfred Neumann, which was published first in, 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 in the original German in an exile press and, and then translated into English as an unshall escape and was actually quite successful. And, and it was based on that that he and then his, his colleague from Vienna, Tan, were hired to then write, write the first uh, treatment, which then Lester Cole put into the. The, the script. So if you look at it from that perspective, one of the things that's interesting in the film is that you have the two brothers, Wilhelm Grimm and Carl, Carl Grimm. Carl is the Nazi, Wilhelm is the social democrat. And that is a trope. Oh, the other way around, sorry. That is that's it's just testing you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> That is a trope you find all over German exile literature. This notion, and you know, many people who were novelists, writers left, and many of them ended up in Hollywood, like Thomas Mann, like Bertolt Brecht, not all of them worked in the industry. But you have, you have this concept of the other Germany, the other Germany being the democratic Germany, the, the Germany that believed in freedom and tolerance, etc. The, the Germany that had 
assimilated the Jews at the beginning of the 19th century and given them complete citizenship, one of the first countries in Europe to do so. And then you have you know, this, other tr this other side, and it's, it's really this motif of the Doppelganger that goes all the way back into you know, German expressionist literature, the, the evil side that is you know, undemocratic, and where there is also a long tradition you know, uh, of the, the Prussian junkers in World War I all the way to the, the Nazi period. Um, you mentioned something in your, in your paper about, this was a very short shoot on this film. Well, I think uh, that um, it was shot very quickly because they wanted to get it three weeks, maybe. Yeah, you remember more than I do, but but you know Hollywood at that time shot films very quickly. In the studio system, you know the the sets are things they reuse. I mean, for for someone who knows Poland, knows that they know that this doesn't really look like the shtetl. You know, it's, it's, we it's happen a, to have a delegation uh, yeah. of 11 students from Polish film schools that are here in the corner. <laughs> I'd love to hear from them. <laughs> Do you have any comments from your, from your group about this? Have you ever seen anything like this? Uh, in those 
those four years because it became important that to make Germans an ally in the fight against the communists. And so the Cold War killed wow. off those prosecutions. And in point of fact, the whole subject of the Holocaust, which was really first presented in the series of documentaries immediately after the war, it was only at that point where many people realized the scope of the show and how, and how unimaginable it actually was. It was suppressed and there were no films made about any of that throughout the 50s and 60s. I mean, the, the uh, Diary of Anne Frank is the first film to pick up on that topic again. That's 62, 63, no, that's so that whole bunch of our period. It was a film made by Gregory Peck. Gentlemen's Agreement? Yes, that's the one. Yeah, yeah, but that's, that's about anti-Semitism, yes. But well, it's well, not well, about the Being anti-Semitism is being anti-Jewish. I agree with you, but that is, it's not specific. Do you need this question? Do you need this question? What was the question? It was uh, you mentioned Gentleman's Agreement as a film about that subject, and I said yes, it's about anti-Semitism, and it's, it's an important film about anti-Semitism, but it wasn't about the Holocaust or what happened in, in that chapter. Candy. Uh, Question? Yeah, there's a question about the Holocaust. What kind of release did it have? What kind uh, of clinical reviews? It, it, the reviews were almost uniformly good. Um, it had a wide release. Um, I'm not sure it actually made one. So, uh, because by 1944, by the time the film came out, and the, literally over 100 anti-Nazi films had been produced, and people were getting tired of it, and you know, people wanted other kinds of escape. So, um, and remember, in 1944, the largest uh, part of the audience in America are women. It's not because the men are often at war. So, um, to follow up to that with how was it received, you're talking about this was the first film that addressed the issue of Jews yeah. in the Holocaust. How was that aspect regarded by people in Kansas? <laughs> As you see the film, I mean, that central scene that, you know, is so powerful for us because we're looking at it in hindsight. And we know what happened after. So there's a, you know, there's a certain teleology that, we, we, that the people at the time didn't have. There were reports of the concentration camps you know, the government knew about Auschwitz to a certain degree, but there were many people that just didn't want this information to get out. So a scene like that, this, the, the authors uh, were smart to couch it in what is a story really about the Poles <clears throat> and about Christian Poles. And you will see, you will remember that Actually, we see maybe one Star of David, and, but the film is chock full of crosses. Oh, the symbolism of him. So in point of fact, again, it is, and, and remember that except for the, the Rebbe, no one is individualized who is Jewish in this film. It is an amorphous mass. Before that, in all of the village scenes, we do not see any Orthodox Jews except the rabbi. Right. And, th and that, so that final scene, yes, it's a scene of revolt and all of that, but, you know, compared to our standards today, it's still, you know, it's, it's, they're still almost othered. Can you talk about the, the death scene of the rabbi when he's doing Kaddish? He's leaning he's, he's, on the... He's leaning on the cross and praying the Kaddish, yes, I know. I mean, it's... It, that blows my mind every time I see it. Wasn't, it wasn't cross. There was the. It was yes. It's, it's it was in the train. It's it's for the train. Yes. But I know. But visually, yeah, it's like also a cross. Yeah. Right. Okay. How about the gentleman in the back with the glasses? Yes. 
Well, you know, Hollywood stay, really stayed away from those kinds of things. I mean, they, you know, all uh, resistance against the Nazis was good. And while in certain films, certain things are coded in certain ways that where you can think, well, maybe this is left. But, you know, Hollywood also made a film called The Chetniks, which was about, you know, I mean, they were right wing. And uh, the Yugoslav resistance group that, uh, so. Bill. Is there any historical evidence that this film had any influence on the actual establishment of the Nuremberg trial? Because this film made in 1943 this idea of a world court. I mean, this was unique in some ways. So is there some thought or is there any evidence that this actually had some influence on the establishment of the uh, Nuremberg trial? Well, actually, I mean, in an attempt to create the United Nations in the 1930s, and there was a, a court attached to that. So it wasn't quite a brand new idea. Um, and the, remember, the Americans, it's a military trial. The, in Nuremberg, there were, it was the, the army prose, who prosecuted that case for, you know, for a supposed international community. But, you know, I mean, historians, I think, today will admit that the, the, while it was all it was morally right, legally the whole proceeding was probably on very shaky ground. So, so there's no evidence that the film had anything to do with the actual. Uh, uh, there's no kind of. Uh, I, I think I think there were lots of voices saying already that it is important that that that. Uh, they be prosecuted in one way or another. How it, and there was and I mentioned that you know at the before I, the film that there was a, uh, an Allied resolution specifically stating that there should be tribunals set up for you know in that, in every country to prosecute uh, the, the uh, these war criminals. Um, yes. that showed themes of the concentration camps was uh, Orson Welles' Stranger. Um, it, 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 the, the lady said that the first film to show themes of the, uh, the concentration camps was Orson Welles' The Stranger, which is 1946, and is, but it's, it's uh, the memory of it. It's, it's, a, uh, it's not actually scenes in the right. concentration camp. But that's the yeah. first Mm -hmm. Another okay. German emigre production. I'm curious as to the backstory a little bit of the script development, given that it was it's going three, and so the script was probably written either right before it or a year or two before. So, how did that information all come to come together? What was the research done? The That's a good question. Well, it, it, uh, I. <clears throat> it, there's a good reason why about a third of the films were written by, by German emigres, because they already had a lot of knowledge for the backstory. And as I said, Alfred Neumann had actually written the novel on which it was based. So that, uh, that's a part of it. Another part is that there was a, uh, quite an extensive German exile press. Many journalists who had been in Germany left often, mostly because they were Jewish, but not exclusively. And they had created uh, newspapers. One of them was uh, published out of Mexico City that was read by almost all of these Hollywood scriptwriters. It was called Freies Deutschland, uh, Free Germany. And it was written by a communist, uh, German Communist Party cell. I mean, they published the newspaper in Mexico City. These were all German Jewish communists who couldn't get in the United States because they were communists, so they published this newspaper out of, out of Mexico City. But it was read throughout the Western Hemisphere. And uh, there's autobiographical and anecdotal evidence from some of these scriptwriters that they read this religiously to get ideas for, you know, new stories about uh, resistance uh, against the Nazis. For people who haven't seen it, uh, and would like to see it, where is it shown, or where can it be seen uh, on demand? 
I have no idea. I don't think it's that it, uh, it's not on demand and it's not out on video. So now this there are many films like that, but this is a, this is yeah. one that again is I important. mentioned earlier that I mean, uh, Dr. Horak has done a paper on this and spoken about this film at other screenings, but it's very rare, and I've learned about it through Roger and through Linda. Um, and their relationship with Marcia. So this was a restored 35 millimeter print that we had to get special permission from Sony. In fact, there are very few theaters that can actually play 35 millimeter anymore. And um, we were lucky that we were able to screen it here tonight. But if it's such a good movie, why does it have to be so obscure? I, there are many that are, but you know, maybe this is maybe we're the trendsetter, and now other festivals will want to start showing it. So I've been proselytizing for the film for a long time, but you know, why don't we take? Oh God, we have a few. Okay, so why don't we take this gentleman who's already standing up? Roger, do you have any insight? Come on down. Does Alan uh, have the answer? This was uh, 44. Oh, she was at MGM. Uh, it's her favorite film role. Uh, she she did uh, Marsha did a lot of loan outs uh, while she was at MGM and while she was at Paramount in the 30s. It was just uh, it was uh, yeah. I, I, well, I, she was a year earlier. She was in another very similar film um, directed by Chris Lang called Hangman. Also got so. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer, but I agree with you that she should be nominated for an Academy Award. She should also win the German Dean Herschel Award for her activism, but I'm not a member of the Academy, so I can't vote for her. Roger uh, and Alan, maybe because you spent a lot of time with Marsha, if she was here right now, what would she have to say about playing this role and about her experience of working on this film? Uh, it was her, one of her favorite experiences. She spoke of it often, and uh, the frustration of the fact that it was, it was such a uh, an unknown film. It didn't have uh, the kind of distribution that uh, we're kind of used to today, and that's why it's so nice that it's been uh, re redone. And uh, this new print is is so different. Years ago, the only one we ever saw, it was so dark, and, and uh, it, it really looked like an old film, and, and this, this restoration is, is really a miracle. But, uh, yeah, you know, it's really s sad that Marcia can't be here. She would love this event. Um, it, it's the very thing she loves to talk about the most. And at 98 years old, she... 98. 98.5. She's going to be 99 in October. But boy, names, dates, times, figures, she's just, she snaps all this out. We're all hoping in our family this is where we're all headed. It's a great sign for the, the gene, we hope. But, but she, uh, she speaks often of this film and, and the influence that it had. But she always treasured um, roles that would let her uh, be seen as a character, a, a character part rather than a leading lady. The opening of the film, she's as herself, where she's the young, uh, hopeful bride and uh, 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 hoping to marry Alexander Knox. But but in the later scenes, when she's older, that was the kind of thing she coveted. And as I said, Dorothy Morris, who played her daughter, was just four years apart, and. Uh, <laughs> That was. She's still alive, Dorothy? No, she's not. Thank you, Roger. No, sorry. <coughs> Dorothy, yeah, she's. Is there anybody else from this film that's still alive except for Martian? Usually not. Oh, I don't think so. No. I don't think so. I know they filmed it in. I know they filmed it in North Hollywood. Marsha told me <laughs> there was some sort of ranch out there. Columbia Ranch. Oh, it was Columbia Ranch. 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 They regressed the Western Street at the Columbia Ranch in Burbank for the Polish Village. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. 
film was nominated for an Oscar for the score, for those of you that thought it was what we forgot. Coming from Stan Tackle, do you have any more information on this you can share? Oh, no, no, no. This is, this is, you, you have Dr. Horak there, and I came here to hear what he had to say. <laughs> no one knows Thank you, Stan. <laughs> I love you, too. <laughs> Why don't we take one last question, Dan, in the back. German, uh, and the cover is all the German, the young German soldiers, and all the German soldiers. Wow. It's a different title. But uh, it's available in German. Well, maybe we'll have to do an encore screening for Marsha's 99th birthday. Can I have a last comment, please? Yes, you can have a last comment. We also regret our group here that Marsha couldn't make it tonight, but maybe I have an idea because uh, there is a Polish film festival every year in Los Angeles in October. Maybe we can show it up to the film at the festival. Maybe we can invite Marsha and all of her. All right, thank you everybody for coming and attending the past week of the Los Angeles Jewish Film Festival.